All right, welcome to part B. Let's take a look at hyperinflation in Weimar, Germany. Now, during World War I, the various nations of Europe obviously went off the gold standard. Gold is not practical in a war even remotely on a scale uh, of that scene during this war. And so gold is completely out of the picture. All gold coins are immediately hoarded. Banknotes, paper currencies are, are inconvertible, meaning you know, no more redemption in gold that includes in England, Germany, France, all of it. Only the United States remained on the gold standard during the war. The U.S. remains firmly fixed to the gold standard. Of course, under the Federal Reserve System at that time. And in the immediate post-war period, in the early 1920s, the U.S. is the only country in the Western world still on a gold standard. Here are the values of the different paper currencies and how much they fell. The British pound fell by 35%, which actually wasn't as bad as uh, the franc or the German mark, which fell by war's end 96%. This is a, the exchange rate between the mark, the main German unit of account, and the dollar. There's a 10 mark note. Uh, this is from 1916. Of course, a $10 Federal Reserve note. Exchange rate before 1919 was about 4 to 1. So to buy a dollar, you had to have four marks, right? By the end of 1919, it's now 48 to 1. So the mark is really beginning to slide in that post-war period. Of course, World War I armistice is agreed upon on November 11th, 1918. So the war is over by 1919. And a treaty is being hammered out at Versailles, which will have a big impact on the German currency system in the early 1920s. The Hyperinflation that Germans experience in the early 1920s, and especially in 1923, is far and away the most famous historical case study of hyperinflation in world history. There's been hyperinflation elsewhere. There's hyperinflation in Venezuela. Uh, Zimbabwe is another famous case of hyperinflation. Obviously, in, in, this, in our country here, in the United States, during the Revolutionary War, there was a uh, hyperinflation of the continental dollar. So this has happened before. But this, the, what we see in Germany in the post-war period really is uh, is something else. I mean, it, it's the f photographs we have of all the hyperinflated away paper currency and all of it, um, quite fascinating and very disturbing. So how did they get there? Well, the Treaty of Versailles, which was agreed upon after the war was over, signed at Versailles June 28, 1919, arranged for reparation payments. Reparation payments. Now, in the treaty, there was the infamous War Guilt Clause, which assigned primary guilt of the war onto Germany. And so, being guilty of the war, Germany had to pay massive reparations. Now, the German government was already deep in debt okay, from the war itself. The German government under Wilhelm II during the war decided to finance the war purely through borrowing. Okay? Other countries raised taxes a whole lot. France, for example, greatly raised the income tax in France in order to help finance the war. They also borrowed some money. Lots of money, actually. But German in, uh, the German emperor purely you know, relies mostly on borrowing and then was banking on the hope that they would win the war, the expectation that they would win the war and then would be able to annex resource-rich uh, industrial regions to the west and to the east of, uh, of Germany and would also be in a position to impose cash payments, reparations of their own, that would bring money into Germany to help them 
repay those debts. Well, Germany loses the war. So there goes that. So Germany had already has all these war debts. And now on top of that, these huge reparations to pay to the Allied powers. And the, the reparations that were demanded amounted to 132 billion gold marks. And by gold mark, you know, the, the, the old classical standard, gold standard mark, right? But it was backed by gold, 132 billion of those. Now, the Allied powers, early in 1921, payments are gonna start to be made. It's, payments will be made in installments. And the Allied powers determine to allow the reparations to be paid either in gold, okay, which the Germans don't have at this point. By the way, the Allies also uh, confiscated Germany's gold supplies. They either pay in gold or in foreign currency. Right? They weren't allowed to pay the reparations in paper German marks because the Allied powers weren't stupid. They didn't want to, the Germans just print away and then, and then to pay reparations in a worthless paper money. So said, no, you got to buy foreign currency and then pay the reparations with that foreign currency. Well, how do the Germans get gold or foreign currency? Well, in that case, <laughs> they could use paper marks. Print paper marks, go out on the market, buy gold or buy foreign currency with those paper marks and then pay the reparations. And there was no limit to how many paper marks the German government could print. And so beginning in 1921, the Reichsbank begins printing, printing, printing in order to make those payments. And the value of the mark goes down, 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 down. Here's a 1,000 mark note. Look at that. By January of 1921, this is the mark dollar exchange rate. To buy a single US dollar, you needed 90 marks. Quite a change from two years earlier. 90 marks. A year later, by 1922, you needed 320 marks to buy a single US dollar. That's a lot of inflation, okay? A lot of inflation. This is a 50,000 mark note. 50,000 marks, my goodness. Well, <laughs> 1922 continues inflating, inflating, or the value is going down, down, down in 1922, and then 1923 hits. In 1923, the value of the currency in Weimar Germany completely, just utterly collapses. Look at this chart here. This is a value of a, of a paper mark in terms of, uh, of the old standard gold mark. This is 19 by 1922, and then 1923 just shoo, Just this vicious, vicious cycle of inflation uh, completely spins out of control. So that some of the, the denominations on these notes are ridiculous. So, Five million dollar note or mark note. Look at this one. Fifty million marks. Fifty million marks. Man, I thought this note was a lot. Guess not. Fifty million marks. Oh, five hundred million marks. Five hundred million marks. <laughs> Y'all aren't even going to believe some of this. Fifty billion. 50 billion mark note. A cool note, I've got to say, but not worth anything. 50 billion marks. Look at this. We thought this was a lot of inflation. It was. By November 1923, to buy a single US dollar, you needed 4.2 trillion marks <laughs> 4.2 trillion marks so you got notes like this I mean, this is beyond absurdity this is a five trillion dollar or five trillion mark note five trillion mark note and this is a 50 trillion 
mark? No, 50 trillion marks. And you'll notice the date here, November 11th, 1923. November 11th, 1923. That's November 9th, 1923. So this was at the at the uh, absolute worst spot. <sighs> Just inflated to oblivion. And of course, the famous or notorious uh, stories of needing a wheelbarrow to buy basic goods. At the end of 1922, a loaf of bread cost 160 marks, which was astronomical. But by the end of 1923, a loaf of bread cost 200 billion marks. 200 billion marks. These are people carrying, uh, carrying money to, to buy basic goods. Children playing with wads of cash. Cheaper than buying a wooden block. Just have wads of worthless paper money. Monopoly money. Uses wallpaper. Fuel. What do, you, what do you even say? You can't overstate just the psychological impact that this had to have had on the German people. Uh, the humiliation, the total shame in a wrecked and looted country as, the, as many Germans interpreted it. Where uh, German marks being uh, at the Reichsbank being set out for getting prepared for distribution. Cartoon from the time. Oh my, oh my. All the hands there on the bottom grabbing for paper money. It's out of control. Um, actually, by late 1922, this was even before all the trillion mark notes and all of it. By late 1922, the German government was having a hard time acquiring foreign currency, much less gold, with the paper marks, and so they defaulted on a few of the payments, didn't pay, make the payments on time. Britain was in favor of giving them a temporary you know, break in sus suspending payments for a period, but France insisted, no, we need our payments. And, uh, and in January 1923, the French and the Belgian armies occupied a major industrial zone in the Ruhr Valley in Germany, Western Germany. It was a major uh, uh, region for uh, coal and for um, in the steel industry. And occupied it to compel the Germans to make their payments and to, uh, and to make sure perhaps those, since they can't buy foreign currency, the reparations can be made in, in, uh, in industrial goods like coal instead of uh, foreign currency. The Germans respond by civil, with civil disobedience, going on strike. Um, this was a, just a total outrage from the perspective of many Germans. Um, uh, over 100 civilians were killed by the French army who resisted the occupation in a total disaster, uh, an international crisis, actually. This, uh, uh, you know, this was Germany's most profitable industrial zone and so this further wrecked the German economy which which then increased the uh, the uh, depreciation of the mark into total hyperinflation in 1923 anyway in 1924 a US diplomat named Charles Dawes stepped in Charles Dawes was a general in World War one diplomat a Republican he was later vice president under Calvin Coolidge in 1925, but he stepped in and devised a plan by which uh, the French and the Belgians would leave the Ruhr region, so end the occupation, and then the Americans would provide loans to the Germans to help them make their reparations payments. The German Reichsbank would be under allied power oversight to make sure that you know the printing would stop and and after november 1923 the printing stopped but in order to make these loans 
the U.S., Charles Dawes, was able to persuade Britain and France to repay their debts to the U.S. from the war. Remember during World War I and um, in the last lecture video the, how uh, the British and the French sold many, many bonds in the United States. And so the British and French owed the U.S. a lot of money. And so the deal was the Allies would repay those debts to the Americans and then the Americans would lend money to Germany and this lending of money was overseen primarily by JP Morgan and Company. So JP Morgan and Company played a really big role in, in, in this whole network here. And then Germany would, would make the reparation payments. This solved temporarily the uh, international crisis and Charles Dawes, besides becoming vice president the following year was given a Nobel Peace Prize in 1925. 1924, the Germans got rid of the old hyperinflated paper mark, just completely replaced it with a new Reichsmark. Um, basically what they did, they just eliminated 12 zeros. <laughs> eliminated 12 zeros from all prices, introduced this new currency. A trillion paper mark note was now convertible into one Reichsmark. So one Reichsmark and one trillion paper marks from the old inflated one was, was the conversion and things began to stabilize a bit by the mid to late 1920s. And in fact, American capital, American finance invested pretty heavily in German industry in the latter half of the 1920s and the German steel industry did very, very well in the late 1920s. And so, you know, that somewhat settled that. But again, the memory, the humiliation the occupation by the French and the Belgian armies radicalized many people in Germany. And of course, uh, I, don't, I don't think I need to explain what sort of impact that had on, uh, on future events in that country. But we'll stop there. And for the final part of Lecture 32, we'll take a look at what happens in Britain, the adoption of the gold exchange standard in the 1920s. See you for part C.